Hey everyone, my name is Andrew O, oh, and I will be your presenter for today. Uh, today we'll be covering the topic of how to find product market fit. Cool, all right, here we go. Um, so again, this presentation is really for both product managers and founders. So if you are one or the other, highly recommend you stay for this presentation because I think this is really important, uh, especially on the founder side. Or if you're, again, a PM working on a startup like zero to one product, uh, this is, I think, really key for you to learn. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get right into it. Let me first uh, explain to you my background. So I started out my career first as a, um, as a founder. I had founded a sports company called Mint Ultimate back in 2013. Uh, broke up, I broke um, over six figures in sales in the first 12 months and uh, expanded that company into over 20 countries in sales. And uh, that was my first startup as a sports company. And uh, then I transitioned to my second startup called Bambify, uh, whereas Mint Ultimate became more of like a four hour work week. So at Bambify, uh, there I had created a marketplace uh, to connect both e-commerce businesses and manufacturers together from premium manufacturers, uh, sorry, from premium uh, countries like Japan and, and Korea. Uh, in order to have a trusted production run going for these e-com businesses. I then uh, got accepted to the Alchemist Accelerator program in San Francisco. So I flew there and uh, worked on my third startup called Super, which was a flying taxi company, failed due to timing issues. And um, <clears throat> at that point, I was really fatigued having done startups for five years. So I transitioned to becoming a PM, moved from North America all the way to Singapore to work at Grab, which is the Uber of Southeast Asia. So I worked there under the trust and safety team as a senior PM and uh, did that for about, um, again, like two years and transitioned to Bike Dance, aka TikTok, where I was a founding PM working on a zero to one product. Um, and that is my uh, career in a nutshell. What I'm doing right now, I just quit my job three months ago to go back to startups, which is what I love to do, um, where I'm currently uh, working on an app called uh, Social City. So we just launched about two months ago. Social City is an app where you can find meetups. Um, these are like small groups of people who are hosting casual hangouts, like going for drinks. Uh, it could be dinner, a work session, stuff like that to make new friends. And at the same time, there's a news feed where you can uh, discover really cool places uh, to go to yourself. Or if you want to see what the typical life of a Japanese person is or Colombian, you can also see where they're going uh, and where they're posting. So that is Social City, the current app that I'm working on right now. All right, so now that we're over my background, let's go right into what is product market fit? This is a question that has a lot of interpretations. It has a lot of different definitions uh, that are used by various people and people have different ways of trying to measure it as well. Um, I will give you my interpretation and my take on it. Um, having been through failures and successes uh, and being all the wiser from all of those <laughs> experiences, product market fit comes down to one simple truth. Do people use the product? That is it. Uh, so when it comes to other things like NPS, when it comes to um, you know, CSAT scores, uh, when it comes even to the user feedback, none of that matters. What does matter is retention. Do people actually use the product? So you need to measure that. Um, and you can get the feedback, you know, from the users themselves to kind of like see, you know, how people are engaging the product, how they feel about it, make any iterations you need to. But really, it, again, I can't stress this enough. It comes down to that simple truth. Do people use it? And I'll give you another great example. Product market fit. Workday. I think it's generally known across the tech community to be a really shit product. Everyone hates it. Yet people still use it. And they are still, for some reason, the number one HRCM solution in the world. Uh, another example, Pokemon Go. Uh, this is a game, especially among the true Pokemon fans, that everyone hates. But there are enough incentives there uh, in daily missions and everything else uh, where it still propels them to one of the top games in the world. Uh, and again, totally conquered uh, most of uh, even Singapore. There's a lot of aunties and uncles who are actually playing this every weekend. Uh, and there is something there. Again, ship products. Um, but people play it, people, and it works, and it works, and there's enough incentives to make that work as well, uh, such as events uh, and transferring Pokemon to the real game. 
where the true fans actually play. So product market fit is, it doesn't have to be a product that people love. It just needs to be a product that people use. And, um, and that gives you a little bit of more leeway in terms of like where you want to prioritize, especially both as a founder and as a PM. Um, and that can be conflicting at times because as a product manager, your job is to um, not only, you know, of course, reach those objectives, uh, accomplish those objectives that the companies has set other, as the OKRs um, to deliver impact. And, you know, a big part of it is also to, the, to deliver a phenomenal experience. But what if the experience is actually not the most important thing? We hear all the time about things like product-led growth. We hear all the time about how, you know, a phenomenal experience can help with retention, engagement, uh, churn, et cetera. But again, none of that matters. They just need to keep using the product. So uh, I'm gonna get into uh, this really important topic. Um, why product managers? I've not met, <clears throat> I've not met one product manager in my entire career so far. Um, and even a lot of founders, I've met like maybe only two founders in my life. Like two, these are, in other words, I've only met two people in my life um, who actually know how to find true product market fit. Uh, but I'll get into why I think most PMs don't know product market fit and how to really get into it or how to achieve it. This is because 99% of the product management jobs that are already out there that you're probably in right now, if you are a PM, you're working on a company and a core product that has already run. Um, and most of what you're doing is just feature expansion, or if you're even higher than that, uh, you're probably just working on product strategy, but again, on a core product that already has the entire audience. Uh, and that already has well beyond product market fit. It's like at a growth stage, maybe it's even mature stage at that point. Um, so there's not a lot, of, there's not enough knowledge circulation. There's not a lot of people in the world that actually understand, especially if they're just coming from the PM side on how to find product market fit, because again, they've never actually worked on a zero to one product. Um, <clears throat> this is really, really important to understand and acknowledge first uh, in order to then understand how uh, you can differentiate yourself and get that experience in order to actually achieve it. So it fundamentally comes to this, um, where to start. And as a PM and as founders, we've glorified this notion of um, solving a problem. I think solving a problem is fine, but most of the greatest innovations in the world, we're not solving a real problem. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem with uh, most people in this community. Uh, what they were doing was just trying to make something 10x better. And uh, I'll give you some examples. Well, no, let me take a step back. Let me define what a problem is. A problem in my definition is a conscious issue um, that one wants to solve uh, every time they come up with this situation. So, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to this, you know, tried and true saying, if uh, you ask people back like 200 years ago, what they would have wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse because that's all they knew. You know, they didn't really have a problem with horses. They got them from point A to point B. Um, yet, you know, this guy named Ford came around and decided to make something better, way better, a car, an automotive. Um, Another example is TikTok. Last time I checked, TikTok was not solving a problem. Um, you might have PMs and uh, you may even have some founders who say, hey, you know what? Like they were solving a problem. They were like make, giving the power of creation to everyone where everyone could be directors. They like really solve that issue of creation. No, dude, that is not solving a problem. Uh, and that is not how you should frame the valid proposition of TikTok e uh, either. TikTok was simply just a better way to express uh, oneself in a socially dynamic environment and then in, um, in a hyper discovery environment. Uh, it was completely open network rather than closed network like traditional social networks. That was a lot of strategy. Um, and that was simply just, again, making something better. It wasn't really solving a, a problem for the user and the user was not even conscious of that made a problem that other people will probably say it was. So uh, honestly, a lot of the best innovations had came up from the right side that you're seeing here by making something 10X better. 
most of the greatest innovations did not come from solving a problem. All the problems have already been solved. Any other problem that's trying to be done is solving something so incremental, it's not even worth going for. So I would highly recommend if you are going to consider on a place to start, you want to make something 10x better and start from there. Now, this is, um, I think, a really important le lesson to learn. Uh, it's a really important principle. This is about incremental improvement. Um, so I was saying that I like to say, if you're not un unlucky, you didn't learn. So when you start, um, when you start something, uh, let's just say you have an idea and you want to go for it. Your chances of success is probably going to be less than 1%. You're just at the idea stage. And if you have 100 people that you just pull out from the streets or maybe from your school or maybe even your shopping community, uh, chances are that 90% of them are gonna fail off the bat. You know, And actually a lot of that is self-defeating. Um, it's a self-defeating mindset. Maybe half of them are not even gonna try. The other, 40, the other 50% will take the first step. Um, the thing is the other half that actually took the first step they automatically improved their chances drastically from maybe 0.1% to 1%. And that scales, that compounds. So the more effort you put in, uh, the more you try, persistence is key. The more you're going to open up other opportunities where people can help you, where you're gonna learn, and where you're going to just incrementally make all these macro decisions along the way based on user feedback, based on mentor advice, uh, based on what you're finding on the research. Um, you're going to make this product better. You're going to learn how to make better decisions. You're going to learn um, how, to, how to succeed uh, in different ways on the product itself, whether that's on growth, uh, designing, building, doesn't matter. Uh, that's not just a principle for product market fit. That's a life principle itself. Um, and so you want to get to a point where you're the most unlucky person to ever find product market fit. Um, because there are people like Zuckerberg, there are people like, um, <clears throat> let me think about the people. I can't really think of others right now. That's time. But, um, you know, you, you basically want to get to a point where you've failed so many times uh, that you've understood the lessons thoroughly in and out of why something will work, why something doesn't work. What is the human behavior? Um, when you learn, when you fail, you learn something. Um, you learn something about people, you learn something about your product. And from there, you make the adjustments required in order to uh, incrementally improve it and therefore increase your chances to succeed. That is a key uh, principle when it comes to trying to find product market fit. So don't be discouraged um, because anytime you have an idea, you're going to launch with it and you're likely going to fail. And that is the core principle of finding it. It's a process. It's not you launch and you either succeed or you fail. That's not how you find it. Um, and so let's just say we had this idea, we launched it, um, and it, and it lands flat enough to ask. And you're gonna wonder what happened because I got all these right signals. Um, I like had this great idea. I, I talked about it to all my friends. I talked about it to strangers. I talked about it. I found out who the target persona, user persona is. Um, and I showed them the designs, the high fidelity prototypes. We have, um, we have iterated the designs until it's fully intuitive. And, um, you know, how, how could this not happen? How, why, why did this fail? Um, you know, we did all the research. Like we talked to dozens of users, yet they're not using the product. It's because user research and all forms of user research, whether that's qualitative or quantitative, uh, can be taken <clears throat> with a grain of bullshit. So um, to kind of like clarify what I mean by that, it's one thing to say something based on your perception of how it's presented to you, uh, aka designs, how the information that you're conveying to the interviewer, to the interviewee, um, how you're explaining it, and they can understand it 100%. They're fully aligned with you. However, it's a completely different story when you actually give them the product and you expect them to stay on the platform or stay on that product for X amount of time. Uh, maybe that's like one month, maybe that's like two months, three months. Um, their behavior is going to change. And I will give you some examples later on on um, how 
I also had recently gone through this with Social City um, and had come to realize that, again, user research uh, kind of went out the window there. So let me show you this first iteration that I had at Social Study. Um, I'll explain the different components here, um, what the research said, and uh, where things went wrong. So again, Social City was a way for people to find both meetups, and it actually was a place to find people as well that you can just find on a map view and directly message, um, or you can just request to attend uh, the meetup itself. So there were a couple things going on here. Um, <clears throat> So when I have this design, uh, I'll just quickly give you a quick uh, design review of this. There's a public view. So these are just like, you can see the entire world, um, all the meetups that are happening. You can see the people uh, that are all around you, or you can filter for just your friends, uh, AKA people that you're following. Uh, just to kind of like have a, um, a vetted view of, the only of only the people you care about. Um, <clears throat> on this tab over here, uh, we have multiple tabs. So you can just uh, filter for just the meetups. You can filter for just the people. Uh, and we had another thing here called open to meet. So uh, if you like tap on yourself, you have an option that will pop up saying, are you open to meet? And if you are, you'll have like a little fire uh, icon here um, to indicate to the people that you're open to meeting right now. So people thought that was really cool. Um, I would totally love to um, just, you know, uh, be open to meet. And um, I think it's also really cool that, you know, um, I can see all these people around me. Uh, I can like message them. I can like find meetups. It's really awesome. I've never seen anything like this. Definitely not um, anything as open network and, or, or, or open world as, as this before. And I would totally use it. I had uh, probably 30 people from all various backgrounds. Half of them are friends, half of them are complete strangers. All say the same thing. Follow the typical guidelines of each research. I asked them very open-ended questions, didn't ask them any leading questions, um, had no taker um, for some of the sessions and then some of the sessions I didn't. But anyways, uh, point is I had a lot of green flags. So then I launch it. And um, turns out that people played around with it for the first five minutes. And a lot of them didn't end up coming back to open up this map view. Actually, what they ended up really engaging with was the newsfeed uh, and just making check-ins. Uh, and that was when I realized there was something wrong here. So that's the key thing. Um, what ended up happening, the results, they ended up, they ended up not really using the product. Um, and so again, we had a lot of green flags and so those green va flags validated their, their interest, but whether they would stay, that's a completely different story that you will never know until you actually launch your product. And so it's not the end of the story here. Um, I made some alterations based on the feedback. I cut out the open to meet to try to simplify the app and the understanding of it because a lot of people were confused about it. About it. Um, although they said they really liked the concept. Um, and then I also uh, got rid of all. So I just defaulted uh, only to the meetup tab first. And then if people wanted to also see other people, they could still message them or, or filter for them right there. And um, turns out that people still didn't really use the app. Um, and because there was a sense of stranger danger that was there, and also they were a little bit, um, uh, they were a little bit um, confused as to like how they can let their intentions be known of like what they're really on the app for, as well as what they want to message for. So I iterated a second time. So over here, uh, this is like a profile view. So you can see that this person's here for all three reasons: for networking, dating, and for friendship. Um, and so what you can do is you can uh, message this person. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a, this is like the wrong design. Um, hold on. So you can message this person and I'll show you here. And when you message, when you click the message button, you're going to get um, this pop-up that says, are you, uh, you can choose a chat topic uh, for social dating or networking. And when you choose that chat's topic, it will come up over here saying, Andrew started a social chat, casually get to know each other. So this makes it really clear off the get-go when you're messaging someone random from the map view of what you're, um, of what you're messaging them for. And, uh, and then you can manage your chats all in the inbox and it'll have the different icons to indicate and remind you uh, what the topic of the chat is. 
a lot of people thought that was a really clever way to uh, get not only address the stranger danger issue, but also to address the awkwardness of um, making your intentions clear on what you're messaging them for. And um, so then when I launched that, when I launched this, um, again, uh, it, it didn't get rid of the stranger danger. And in fact, I had a lot of women uh, messaging me saying that they felt really uncomfortable about these guys messaging them about dating. And, um, you know, these are like normal guys. Some of them are weird, but most of them are normal. And that's when I, again, had just realized this is not working out. So I actually cut this feature entirely. And I also cut out the goal tags uh, to simplify the app further again. And that's, again, a process of iteration. You just have to keep going at it over and over, beat it down like a drum until you finally get something that works. But you're getting signals. You're, you're learning and you're understanding why it didn't work, why it failed. And that's the key part. Product market fit is a process. It is not a pass fail situation as soon as you launch. Don't make a decision right there and then. Product market fit usually takes anywhere between two to 24 months. It can take a really long time, but you just can't give up. All right. Um, so again, you just got to iterate your way to product market fit. Um, as long as you have a core product, that core product can always be adapted. And so, um, you know, there were, and let, let, we can just go over some quick examples of this. Snapchat starting out, started out as this promiscuous uh, way to message each other uh, for college students, things that you shouldn't be messaging each other or showing videos of. And um, YouTube started as a dating platform. Uh, hell, I started out as a, what you just saw there, uh, a map-based social product. Um, and none of those products are what they are today. Instagram was a bourbon photo sharing app, and now it's a life sharing app and so much more. Um, as long as you have a core product, you need to get the feedback and you need to continuously iterate until you find that fit. And a lot of the time, some people are going to get really upset about this because they're going to start realizing um, that their initial vision and what they really wanted this to be for the, from the very beginning is actually not what it's going to end up becoming. Uh, so as a founder, as a product manager, um, you have to accept this. But of course, if you're working as a product manager in a company, uh, company strategy is usually set, whether that's from the strategy team, the CEO, there's a lot of alignment that happens on the sweet, sweet um, level or the exact level. Um, and so usually if that strategy is really towards that one way, um, unfortunately, that very often means that you can't deviate from it. And most likely, uh, you're going to fail. And sometimes, again, product market fit is not always about products. Product market fit is also about strategy. It's also, it's also about, um, it, it, it's about the strategy, the operations, and everything else. Um, and so product is only one core part of that. And as a product manager, you're going to be very limited in what you're um, subsequently going to be able to do with that. Um, so again, uh, core product, once you have that, um, keep testing things, keep experimenting, uh, keep interviewing your users, stay really close to them. Because for you, again, it's you're going to be habituated to the product over and over and over again. You're the one that works on it every day. You're the one that looks at the designs every day. So you can never see it as a new user. And if you can see it as a new user every day, it probably means you won't be remembering this discussion because because uh, it means you have a learning disability. So uh, that's what learning is. That's what habituation is. Um, and so keep adapting, keep iterating. I'm going to get now give you some, uh, what I call safe areas on kind of like some, some kind of like a little little trick that you can use in order to uh, have a direction uh, of a product in a way that uh, that may more likely have some sort of fit. So number one, existing behavior. Um, you want to try to go for something that people are already doing. Uh, so observe them. Actually, I think Steve Jobs did a really great job at this. Uh, there is this kind of like BS um, uh, saying that he he never did user research, um, he may not have been doing what product managers and founders are doing today, you know, which is where, you know, you just go up to them and you're like, you're asking a ton of questions and you're showing them your designs all the time. He did a lot of research. 
he just wasn't talking to them, but he was observing them. He was observing the behavior. And that, and from that, he was able to come up with great ideas that actually ended up doing some really magical stuff. And he was also testing a lot uh, after that, after he got the idea, then he started testing a lot inside the company uh, with the, with, with his employees. So again, um, existing behavior, this is really key. Understand the motivations, actually see what they're doing today, whether that's like how they're going to go eat, um, how they're using utensils, how they're traveling, um, any kind of action, there is always an opportunity there. Um, and there's an opportunity to learn. So go after things that they're already doing. Um, because behavior doesn't really change and to create new behaviors is extremely hard. Second, uh, in terms of, aside from what they're currently doing, uh, there is, uh, we are human beings. We're all really emotional um, uh, beings. And so you can always try to feed the ego. What I mean by this, classic social media, um, they have found great ways to feed the ego. So if you're making any kind of like social component or social virality component into your product, um, you can always try to feed the ego itself. Um, all these feel good features, credentials, credibility within the network or the platform that you have. Um, so for example, you know, being a coach on exponents, um, being a, um, a superstar LinkedIn profile, uh, having a, uh, check mark on Instagram, uh, having a ton of followers, having a ton of engagement, like likes and comments on your posts, all of that is feel goods. And, uh, it elevates you to thinking that you're a little bit higher in society, feed the ego. Um, if this part is applicable to you, uh, this, this is a great way more so to kind of like keep loyalty, keep retention, uh, but also can also fuel engagement as well. And the third area um, is to make a dream come true. So I'll give you some quick examples of this. Class Pass, when they first started out, you could go to, um, you can go to studios on limited times a month and then became unprofitable, but um, that's how they started out. And it was a dream come true. You could just go to any gym, feel like a king or a queen, but you can just go anywhere, walk in anywhere and just do a class. That was a really magical experience. Um, movie pass, the notorious movie pass. Go see a movie as many times as you want for nine bucks a month or 10 bucks a month. Uh, that's insane. Um, and there were a lot of people that took advantage of that and they thought movie pass was the best thing in the world. Uh, and that led them to getting a ton of traction, ton of growth, ton of users, just through word of mouth. You can always make a dream come true. Uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, when I mean it doesn't work, uh, usually when you make a dream come true, it is, uh, it's a dream that doesn't come true for one side and usually that's the business side. So um, if you do, if you finesse it like ClassPass did where eventually once you have the core user base, you, you make the adjustments, get the unit economics right and you adjust the plans, you can make that work. So these are some safe areas, um, best practices that uh, I think a lot of people should be considering when they're, um, you know, again, thinking about how can they find product market fit in this idea or this space that, um, you know, we're considering. All right, so just to conclude, uh, just to summarize um, what the process of how to find product market fit. Again, it's a process. It's an iterative, long, tedious process. You need to keep going at it. Don't give up. Um, and your chance of success compounds. If you're a founder, you have all the freedom in the world to keep going at this. If you're a product manager, um, no matter what level you are, uh, that's going to be a lot different because, again, you're going to be confined to a certain space, a certain area. And so iterating yourself to find that product market fit means that you may very likely have to deviate entirely from the strategy. So what you can do as a product manager is you can try to upsell and manage upwards um, to convince leadership of another potential opportunity in new space, uh, if need be. Um, but again, you know, that's also really risky for, the, for, the, uh, for your managers, for your leaders, because um, it's uncharted territory and uh, it means throwing in resources to something that has no guaranteed success. But then again, most things um, that made it really far had even worse odds. So 
uh, that's something for them to digest. But and it's also up to you and how you're able to upsell that to them. Uh, secondly, uh, again, uh, user research can be uh, can really be full of shit. Just be very careful about um, the kind of feedback that you're getting, or rather, the fee the feedback you get in the ideation stage and the design stage is always inevitable. Um, it is going to be what it is, but just don't say your expectations too high if you get a lot of green flags, otherwise it's gonna really put you down. Um, so don't be too discouraged when you launch it, thinking it's gonna work and it doesn't. And then finally, go after greener pastures. Um, try to go into the safe areas that we mentioned before, existing user behavior. Um, you can go after feeding the ego or uh, you can kind of make a dream come true in a product and that itself uh, can uh, really help get a lot of traction in the early days and then you can make the adjustments later on. All right, so I hope this is super helpful for you guys. If you want to follow up, if you have any questions, you can uh, contact me through the details below. Uh, please give me an ad on LinkedIn and um, thank you so much for joining and I will hope to see you soon.